Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of The Debrief, and we're starting a new season. It's 2023. It's the year of another Olympic qualification, and uh, things just wrapped up yesterday in Hachioji for the first Boulder World Cup of the year. To break it down, as always, I've got my trusty sidekick, John Bergman, uh, coming in from Indianapolis, USA, writes for Climbing Magazine, covering the competitions, and of course, he wrote High Drama, The Rise, Birth, uh, sorry, the rise, fall, and rebirth of American competition climbing. Buy it, uh, buy it online or in stores. And then our special guest for this episode is Bjorn Pohl, joining us from Stockholm, Sweden. He's a commenter, commentator, uh, and of course, he does the Climbing Intelligence Agency interview series and podcast on YouTube uh, with Vladik Zoomer. Check that out. Uh, they had uh, an interview from just last year when Mejdi won his first gold medal, which is extra topical now. So make sure you check that out. There's a link in the description box uh, below. Before we get into the headlines, let's just do a quick recap in case nobody was paying attention. Uh, the round started out with the women's side on uh, on Saturday, and of course, Brooke Rabatou takes her first gold. Hannah Moyle takes another silver medal, and Anon Matsufuji debuts uh, on the medals with a bronze. And for the men, Mejdi Schalk gets his second gold medal, followed up by uh, Hannes van Duysen, who gets his silver and podium debut, followed up by Paul Gent earning a bronze, making for the first time in quite a while uh, a, a three-way European podium, which was interesting enough by itself. Uh, let's get into it. We're going to start with the headlines. Guest always goes first. So Bjorn, this one's all you. Tell me tell me what was the headline from Hachi Oji? All right. So uh, no big surprises here. Uh, Brooke is a big breakthrough is my headline. Um, quite obvious. Why? Uh, I think, uh, I mean, this is Brooke's first win on the World Cup. And uh, the way she did it, with uh, the confidence she climbed with, the authority, uh, I mean, quite amazing, actually. John, this one's all you. I felt you like, you know, if, if we hadn't given it to Bjorn, I know you would be, you'd be taking this topic all day. Finally, a big win for the girl, right? <laughs> it was a phenomenal performance from Brooke. There's really so much you could say about this. I, I guess I'll start by saying it was just really fun to watch her in the semifinals and in the finals because there was just something about her, the, the way she was dialed in and, and focused. It's kind of an intangible subjective thing, but I certainly picked up on it. And I think other people did as well. Matt groom on commentary noted that, that Brooke seemed particularly focused and dialed in. It's rare when a competitor has that sort of tenacity and, and poise for, through, throughout all rounds of a competition, but Brooke certainly had it here. And I guess when looking at it panoramically, I feel like we've kind of already praised Brooke, uh, sort of her, her breakout or, or her, I guess we would call it her um, living up to the, the hype, I suppose, right? Because she did qualify for the Olympics and we praised her there and she got some world cup podiums in the past and we praised her there but that's all different than a world cup gold medal a world cup gold medal is is a, a class all of its own brooke finally does it so i know we might seem like kind of a broken record here but this was a case of brooke finally if, dating back to when she was I don't know, like five or six years old and on these YouTube videos as Robin Herbisfield and DDA Rabatou's daughter, she she had all this this hype and expectations kind of foisted upon her. Uh, and like I said, she kind of lived up to that in uh, in those other accomplishments. But here with this World Cup gold medal, I think it was officially Brooke living up to all those expectations that the climbing world has had about her ever since she was kind of that golden child, the the child of these two World Cup champions. Uh, so it was just, it was exciting. And, and I know there are some statistic statistical uh, buffs that watch this. So I'll, I'll just chime in here. I wrote this in my climbing magazine recap, but by my calculations, it, granted, it's a little difficult to pinpoint exact dates of final rounds from competitions of decades ago but i think this gold medal by brooke rabatou was 
996 <laughs> days after her mother, Robin Herbisfield's last <laughs> World Cup, which occurred in late 1995. That was Robin's last World Cup gold medal. And 11,846 days after Brooke's father, D.D.A. Rabatou, last won a World Cup, which was in 1990. So, I think uh, I'm going to have to correct you on that number. <laughs> yes, please. Yes. <laughs> I was going to say, you could, rent a, you could uh, write a, a rent musical number based on, based on those numbers if, you, uh, if you've got the, the, the uh, playwright shops in you. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask because I, I was watching, but we had the audio turned down quite a lot. Did, do you guys recall if they were drumming up, uh, like if Matt and uh, I can't remember who else was on the commentary for that Quinn, were they drumming up the idea that she was the daughter of greatness or did they kind of leave that? Because I didn't hear much of it from what I heard and that made me really really happy, honestly, to really leave the moment with Brooke, because I think all of us are aware of the context. But I thought it was very nice that it stayed Brooke's achievement. It was kind of nice that Robin didn't appear to be there. And it, you know, the camera stayed on Brooke. It was about Brooke. And uh, it, you know, we all understand the context, but it was her moment sort of thing. For sure. I did not hear them necessarily hype Brooks pedigree and her parents and all that, which I liked as well. And actually when I was writing my recap, other than that little statistic, I purposefully tried not to really draw a lot of connections to Robin or to DDA, because I think it's time that we stop doing that. Brooke does not need uh, this preface. Every time you say her name, that she is the daughter of these world cup champions. I think if anything, this world cup victory puts her in like being able to stand on her own. Granted, she was, arguably already there with the Olympic qualification and everything, but she now has a World Cup identity that is completely separate from all of that heritage. And uh, and and she just had a, a masterclass of a performance. That's the phrase that I use. That's the phrase that other people used. It was just a wonderful weekend for Brooke and, and certainly a long time coming and very well deserved if anybody's been just following her Instagram and knowing how much she's been training for, for years now to get this gold medal. I'm, I'm definitely just going to say that. Uh, sorry. Go ahead. Do you take it? Yeah. I'm um, just going to say that, that uh, I was this, when someone is in the zone like this or in the bubble, so to speak, I mean, it always makes me a little bit nervous because you, you never know, like as long as it's going fine, everything's, you know, topping and, and not slipping or anything. It's it's fine, but as soon as it starts going, you know, sideways, you can easily just lose it, right? But uh, not this time. It was fantastic to see. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull my legs out from under me later on with with one of my later points. But I wanted to say <laughs> that Brooke had one of the few convincing performances of this competition, right? Uh, you know, she she ended up with <laughs> it's ridiculous to say, but she had more than two tops in finals. Um, she was one, basically the only athlete of the competition that looked like she retained her form through an extraordinarily difficult semis and finals, whereas everybody else looked like they took a beating really right Brooke overcame so much of that and so while I think you can I'm you know we're gonna kind of go into how difficult this round was she was the one that really felt like she she uh, uh she stood up to it and she conquered the challenges that were in front of her um the, the one thing I want to bring up just because it keeps knocking me out every time I look at it it was a complete fluke that we ended up with no former world cup winners in this final and of course I have to look back and figure out when the last time it was that that happened and so for the women's it was grid 2006 was the last time we had no previous female winners so so that's going back what like you know 17 years back my math is not good enough to handle double digits mathematics um but the storyline of that comp like almost perfectly mirrors this competition you go in where the former champion at that point Sandrine Levé is not going to be competing at these competitions in the same way that Yanya has already announced she is not going to be competing at these comps. And so in 2006, you're at these competitions and the only favorites at that point are Olga Bibic and Juliet Danion, who had just won her first World Cup recently. They're both strong climbers, but always in the shadow of Sandrine, right? You're not going to win that gold if Sandrine is there. Sandrine is gone. The favorites fall out in qualifiers. At this point, there was no semifinals in 2006, right? So Olga and, and uh, uh, Juliet fall out in qualifiers, and you're left with this field of all of them being first-time 
gold medal, you know, possibilities, right? And then, of course, the winner that weekend is Anna Storr, who goes on to have the most legendary female bouldering career, arguably. And I don't want to put that challenge on Brooke, obviously, because, you know, <laughs> Yanya has not retired in the same way that Sandrine did. Um, and this was a very difficult round, and, and it's hard to match up to a legend like Anna Storr. But I love the parallels and how how closely tied those two events are 17 years apart um can't stop thinking about it i might have to make a video just on that topic because i think it's so cool but uh yeah very cool history tie-in anyway john i I really want to know what your headline was since bjorn took away the uh the flag waving star spangled awesomeness of brooks win from you and to be fair that probably brooks win would be my headline as well to kind of peek behind the the curtain here we a lot of we try to each choose a separate headline. And so I, I want, I, I, to me, Brooke was the big story. I'm, I'm glad Tyler, that you pointed out that she did have the most convincing performance. I think that's a really good way to put it. Uh, I think Brooke kind of saved this event. The fact that at least we did get one convincing performance from somebody uh, saved this event because I, the reality is, and, and maybe we, we should sort of put Brooke's, win aside her win notwithstanding my headline would be i felt like this event was kind of a lousy way to kick off the season it it was kind of a dud of an event in my opinion and maybe we'll have some differing opinions there but let's break it down a little bit first of all as we were just talking about you had no yanya garnbrett and i know that there's probably some listeners out there that (laughs) roll their eyes every time we say yanya's name even on she's not even present at this competition and we still are talking about her but the fact is she is the biggest star of the of the circuit right now and star power matters and to not have the biggest star of the circuit present for the fir- to kick off the season that was a, a major downer but then let's look through the proceedings a little bit let's start with the women's division the women's semi-final round which was the first round that was live streamed we didn't get to see the qualification round not bad separation in the women's semi-final round but we did have i think the top seven women all had two tops which is probably not ideal it was a little bit of a, a traffic jam there and then in the finals yeah there uh, yeah up on screen people can see the the yeah that's hannah at top so that's the semifinals. And then if you switch over to the finals, other than Brooks' masterclass, as we've labeled it, only Hannah Moyle had a a top. (laughs) And so everyone else got essentially shut down. I know that there was some separation with the zones and whatnot, but pretty devoid of tops in the women's final. And then switching over to the men's division, in the semifinals, it was almost an hour before we had a top. Mejdi's top of boulder four came i i looked at the clock it was 55 0 50 minutes into the live stream which is a long time for people to wait for a top especially considering that we've been waiting what like six months right because this is the first event of the season so that was a little bit of a bummer and then in the finals the last two boulders were uh, pretty much duds no tops it was a very anticlimactic way to end that round I emailed my editor at Climbing Magazine, Delaney Miller. We were talking briefly about this, and I said, yeah, it just kind of felt like the route setters miscalibrated the skill set of the competitors for this whole event. It just they were off. They were off on their skill set. They were off on their, their ability to do certain moves. Now, of course, there's no reason to think that won't get fine-tuned in competitions to come, but, it, but something did feel just a little off kilter here for this one that and if we could even deep dive a little further i was a little shocked that semifinals the women's semifinals so it's the first live stream of the whole season starts with a slab i that was a little baffling to me (laughs) because i i i think that to take the sport to the next level 
the route setters should be and the event organizers should be cognizant of stuff like that as minor as it seems right they should be cognizant of the difficulty of the route they should be cognizant of the safety of the route of course but then they should be cognizant of the the viewer experience of the route and so to start off with a, a slab seemed a little weird and then of course we had two boulders one in the women's semifinal and then one in the women's final that both had that swinging uh, coordination start it was almost a, a an identical move at least to the layperson i didn't think we needed two of those swingy moves so close in in such close rounds like that so i'll stop rambling here but i just i yeah, didn't Bruce know you were so anti crazy. root setter man that's crazy i didn't know yeah i didn't know you were a closeted like root setter hater wild bjorn do you have any <laughs> thoughts on this <laughs> uh i mean i have yes um i mean first of all i mean it's a matter of what you like to watch, I guess. Um, personally, I rather have a super hard round than two of the new tops, uh, for sure. Then again, I think that uh, all problems should be topped, ideally, by someone in each round. And that didn't happen. So I can't say that the uh, anything else than that uh, the um, the level, like the the it was too hard, basically. It was, but um, then again, the problems, I like them. I li like the fact that you could actually through the round, see how people progressed, got better and better, solve the uh, different, you know, sec sequences of the problems actually. And when, um, like you said, like when Mehdi sent the first bullet in the semi-final round, um, I mean, I had fun until then. So <laughs> I had no problems with, with uh, this level actually my my headline is actually a perfect rebuttal to this with with like a slight a slight tweak so so my headline was going to be that unreliable boulders create an unreliable narrative so there's basically like two parts to this concept and the first one is i really liked the boulders i thought they were great i thought the ones that were too hard were only narrowly too hard all of them felt like on a slightly different day for the most part, they all could have gone, right? Like people were, you know, touching the finish holds, getting real close. And so I, I don't want to like put any, any negative vibes out about the boulders. They were just statistically too hard. But if we did, if we ran the same round tomorrow, I feel like some of them could have been topped under slightly different conditions. A, a big thing for me, John, I like, I don't know what your situation was for watching this, but just the time zone that I had to, you know, watch these during made it so that anything that was remotely boring was amplified by like 10 because my body just wanted to be asleep, right? Like if you're watching, if you're watching Nobody Top at 4.30 in the morning, I, I wanted my eyes to close. And so I understand that so I'm a little bit biased in terms of me personally feeling like the rounds were a little boring. Uh, but the big thing with the boulders for me was because so f relatively few boulders got topped, and in some cases, some of the boulders didn't even get zones, right? Is it really messes with our ability to gauge who was actually strong and who was not at this competition, right? So of uh, what, what's the stat I've got here? There were only nine tops in all of men's semifinals, right? Problem number one, nobody got. Uh, and problem number two saw only a single top, right? Hannes van Doysen somehow pulling out the one top that nobody else could do, which should be setting mm -hmm. off like a red flag. Like there should be an alarm going off in your head if a guy who's never made podium before is the one guy to top a boulder. That's kind of weird. Um, in finals, only four tops in men's finals. Number three didn't go. Number four didn't even see a zone, right? So already you're cutting down the number of boulders that we're measuring all these people against. The sample size is shrinking. And whoever comes out as a winner from this is, you know, much less uh, you can't. You just can't rely on that being an actual measure of their strength if we had gotten to see them over nine doable boulders, which was not the case. Um, same thing with the women's, not as bad in semis, but again, in, in women's, only four tops. So at the end of this, Anand Matsufuji earns a bronze with two tops, not in finals, two tops, between semis and finals, just two tops got her a bronze medal, right? Mejdi gets gold with just three tops across semis and finals combined. And then, of course, Hannes, who is the the most uh, uh, kind of, um, uh, he's the outlier of this competition. He gets his first World Cup medal. He gets a silver with a total of two tops across both rounds. Out of nine boulders, two tops is what it took to get him there. So I love these stories. I love the personalities that we got to saw. Hannes was awesome to watch. But... 
this round doesn't affect my priors for who I think is strong and who isn't because the difference between the number of tops, like a gold medalist, a silver medalist, a bronze medalist got at this comp and the people that dropped out of semifinals was like literally two tops between a gold medal and, and being the last place of semis. So this was a weird one. I liked the boulders. It was a little boring, but I thought they were pretty much on par, but ultimately don't take anything from this comp as changing up who's on top and who's not. It was a weird one. So that's my headline. Tyler, you, you said you were going to offer a rebuttal, but, and you said you liked the comp, but I feel like all I did. Of your, I did. All of... you said, all of your explanation was an affirmation of what I said, not a rebuttal of what I said. Uh, <laughs> No, I, I really liked the boulders because it felt like they were pushing boundaries. And that's what got me really excited was seeing like, holy crap, these are the kind of boulders that on a different day they could send. Or more importantly, when everybody gets warmed up, these are the kind of boulders they're going to be sending by the end of the season or maybe next year. Like it felt like a glance into the future a little bit, men's four particularly. And I mean, that one was easier to illustrate because every single one of the root setters felt compelled to share that footage of Mejdi topping it later just to, you know, you know, we were right all along kind of thing. Um, but all the boulders felt like they were just, you know, maybe they aren't 2023 boulders, but maybe they're 2024 boulders. And that's really cool to watch. I really liked it. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, it was really cool to watch it. Really fun to watch it. And I mean, so much climbing being done still, I think. Mm -hmm. So many moves. But uh, sure, the, the end result wasn't what... what um what we wanted, I guess. I guess that's a good that's a good point. Saying there's so many moves was for all the tops that didn't go, there were a ton of people touching that final hold, right? For all the mm. zones that didn't go, there were a ton of people touching that zone hold. It was it was you know so close for a lot of these, right? It was just barely, just barely too hard. Mm. Yeah, well said. And and I, I mean, I certainly wasn't bored watching this competition. No. I don't want to imply that. I don't think the the routes were or the boulders were boring at all. I actually really enjoyed it. And I, and I do agree with you that it was kind of some next level setting potentially. And there were some really cool isolated moves too. Even that one slab that had the, the top hold that was like a double mono. That was, that was really, really cool. I can't recall us seeing that on a, on a world cup. So Maybe Tyler, that, that felt like saying, such a meme finish, by the way, the old like, like huck into a huck into a one finger or two finger pocket. That's that's like a classic root setter joke is. But anyway, yeah, it, it worked for a couple climbers. Yeah. Yeah. So whether you want to say it was a great comp or, or a dud, I think maybe we're more in agreement that it was just kind of weird. <laughs> it's just yeah. some weirdness at play yeah. here. The results were weird. Yes. For yes. sure. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk about the winners then. Uh, headlines out of the way. Um our big winners, John. I want to start with you for this one, just to shake up the order a little bit. Um, tell me, tell me who is your uh, who came away from this with the most uh, the most gained? Yeah, I. I so uh, let me think how to, did I, I word that? Did I word that really poorly for who you've chosen? <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm I'm trying to give this. I I want to make sure I give this the seriousness uh, that it deserves because my. Uh, my winner would be the German squad, the German team, and the way that they they rallied uh, in the in the the pa amid the the passing of their teammate Christoph Schweiger, who we haven't talked about yet, and I think we should acknowledge maybe right here. It's a good point to acknowledge just the the horrible tragedy that occurred just you know days before, a week before or so before this event, which was Christoph's passing and so before i get into the winner uh, uh maybe we should just talk about crystal i it's just um i was uh, like everybody i think our whole comp world was really stunned by that i did not know christoph personally i hadn't really had had much interaction with him uh, although if if i can kind of maybe shine a some happiness on his memory here i'll say that i did always kind of notice him because I always uh, pay attention to competitors that wear that compete with glasses because I wear glasses when I <laughs> climb as well. And so, um, so I was, he was kind of always on my, on my radar. And I remember last year uh, at the Salt Lake city world cup, I had some brief interaction with the whole German team because I actually bumped into them when I was buying some groceries for my hotel room. I bumped into the whole team uh in a grocery store aisle just randomly and they were all they were buying like granola bars and all that stuff for the week and i just remember thinking how how uh, 
happy the team was, how much good spirit they had, how much they just really seemed like one big happy bunch of friends, and Christoph was among them. And then I actually ended up sitting next to Christoph during the finals of, I think it must have been the first Salt Lake City World Cup. And he, like I said, I didn't know him real well. We exchanged pleasantries. He was very quiet, but I just remember... Um, being impressed by how much he was supporting his other teammates and, and, and whatnot, and just really being a, a, a wonderful teammate. And that seems to be the sentiment that so many people have shared on social media in this past week was just how he was a, a great supportive teammate and he was just a great person. And so I just think we should start by saying, saying that acknowledging his, his tragic passing. Um, uh, that being said, my winner would be the German squad because I don't think anybody would blink an eye if the German team wouldn't even have wanted to compete this this week in Hachioji, right? I mean, amid just the grief and all that, uh, I think it would have been perfectly fine if they just said we're not in any position to to be on the wall this weekend. Our headspace isn't there. and And yet, amid that, and of course, results are not at all important in the scheme of things here, but they did manage to just have a really awesome performance overall. They really, it was just a, a I think a great um, kind of coming together, a great performance in his memory. I, I'm guessing just because Kristoff would have loved for them to just compete and, and do, do the best that they could. So Hannah Moyle ends up getting a, a silver medal and she actually led out of the semifinals um, Lucia Dorfel ended up being 17th on the German team. So she was in the semifinals. Yannick Flohe in the men's division, 11th place, also in the semifinals. Uh, so I just thought I was really impressed with the German team this whole weekend. And so they get, they deserve my, my winner. The only thing I want to add, because I, I think like with, with stuff like this is, is it, I mean, it's obviously tragic, all these young people, and it feels like the last couple of years, it seems like we've started or ended every season with with a really young climber passing away, sadly. Um, but this one, the, the, the thing that stuck with me here was finding out that he was, you know, killed by a, a driver uh, who hit him and his girlfriend at this particular intersection in Arco, um, which not just for the pro world cup athletes, but for all the youth world championship athletes over the last couple of years, they're going to know this intersection because it's the spot where you cross the main roads, just, I think two lanes wide where you go from the Arco, the legendary like Arco climbing stadium into the old town where you go to all the restaurants and your hotels and your hostels. It's this transition period where you leave the river and you cross into the town and Every climber that's been an arco for a competition, which is probably almost all of them on the World Cup circuit nowadays, have crossed the same crosswalk with gelato in their hand or, uh, you know, uh, their climbing bags going to rest for the night or whether it's in the morning and they've just had their coffee and they're excited walking to the stadium to climb or watch their friends. Um, just the location of it was so jarring. Because that crosswalk in 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 climbing, it's it's not something that anybody's bothered to think about until this moment when we say, "Wow, that's that's you know we've literally all walked in those those footsteps that tragically seem to be where he died," uh, and that's really jarring to to know that we've all kind of tread that same path and and it ended so poorly for him when that place is you know an area of like such good memories and and nostalgia for all the climbers that have enjoyed the great weather and the great climbing and and the culture and food and all that stuff. So that was really. Um, it made it feel extra tragic, but something that makes it a little bit easier to connect to. Um, I always find it hard to mourn people who I don't know. Um, but that little personal connection certainly makes it a bit more, uh, a bit more, uh, salient. Um, yeah, I, I don't know much else to say, honestly, but, uh, but yeah, it was a, a really rough start to the season. I think you're right to say that, uh, the Germans handled it, handled it well. And, uh, I think we'll be climbing in his memory for, for the season. Yeah. I don't know if you have anything to add Bjorn or, um, not really. I had no idea that uh, it happened in Arco for, for one thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can't say that I knew Chris at all, really. I, I, I mean, I've shot him several times. Mm -hmm. um, with a camera, of course, from, yes. With the camera, of course, yes. yes. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I remember seeing him first time in, at the Adidas Rockstars, probably the uh, ticket to Rockstars. He was one of the, right. the um, really young people getting into that competition and, and qualifying for the actual things so to speak uh, a while back 
it's, it's a sad story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think the mm-hmm. um, amid the sadness is, or some of the kind of the fact that n- it sounds like all three of us didn't know him. And I think that just kind of adds to it because I'm, I'm kind of left and we're kind of left wondering what he was like. And we, I'm sh- we would have liked to get to know him. Right. I, I wish it's just, um, that's part of the tragedy is that we won't get to know him on the world cup circuit anymore, uh, or further in years to come. And, and, uh, just awful. Just yeah. Yeah, really terrible. Yeah. Let me, uh, let me move it on to my winner, which is, is a, a little bit fluffy. There's not a lot of substance to it, but just something to note. Um, you know, aside from Mejdi in particular, or Paul in particular, I thought this was a, a huge weekend for France, just given the buildup to the Paris Olympics. Um, Mejdi is is obviously like a, a talismanic climber and the fact that he brings this en- energy and this image and, and, and just a magnetism that makes him exciting to watch. And to start the season for the qualification year with a win from him, uh, I think is a huge deal right now. I think all of us are, have a lot to gain from the French media and the Olympic media, finding somebody French to latch onto for climbing and to take those climbers that maybe they're focusing on a, you know, a French swimmer or a French runner. And now some of those cameras are going to turn around and focus on this French climber and, and see the way that he can engage an audience and the way he can climb. Uh, and so I think this is an awesome start. I'm not psyched about him being compared to Adam Andra in a two person candidate vote for the greatest of all time that the Paris Olympics put on their Twitter, which just made me absolutely melt asking who is the goat of bouldering Adam Andra or Mejdi Shalk. But I'm not going to get into that because I'm trying not to take the bait anymore, even though that definitely got me that day. I had to delete some of my replies to that particular tweet. Um, but oh, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy with very happy with uh, uh, that. We got this great French boost at the start of the season. I think that's going to be good for everybody. Um, and that's all I got winners wise. I'm going to have to add there that, um, I mean, as much as the the French men's team and men's team impressed uh it was um, you know the um french women's team didn't sure yeah. i mean they, um they have so many strong young uh female climbers that i expected more from actually this time then again really? it's just one comp and and um we'll see what happens in in um in um uh, soon mm-hmm I mean, we have Orian, we have Agat, we have uh, Selma, we have a like, bunch of people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think uh, I, 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 I guess for me because I I feel like France is always a country that has a lot of names, but for the most part, I don't mm. see any of them in finals. Right? I'll see them for a little bit in semis, um, and mm. maybe maybe that will change this year. But for now, I think on the French women's side, the people they're looking to are Orian most dominantly maybe some people are still holding on to julia chanardy although i think that's an unlikely bet and then mm. honestly i'm even surprised that some people are still saying fanny Joubert. the only hope on that side is the fact that france gets a host place so i guess yeah that could happen but otherwise i think that ship has mm. sailed as well um but anyway um yeah let, let me clarify i didn't expect more in more than probably orian in the finals but right. in the semis i expected a couple yeah that's fair enough yeah yeah, yeah, completely. Yeah. yeah, Bjorn, who did you think was your uh, your winner from the event? <laughs> well, who else but Hannes van Dyson. Sure, yeah. The uh, Belgian guy coming in, best results at 31st. He somehow climbs this slab in the semis, which earns him the spot in the final. And I think he did well in the final as well, you know? He yeah. did second place. So. <laughs> he held his own. Like, and, you, you would typically say somebody that gets kind of like kind of like the fluke ticket, and it was the flukiest mm. of flukes. You top the one boulder nobody else can top, and then you don't top mm. the ones that everyone else, else does, right? I would normally expect that person to finish finals in sixth place. Exactly. So, um, yeah, it's going to be super interesting to see because like, like you said, Tyler, that I, I didn't expect him to do so well in the finals as he did. And not only the actual result, but how he climbed. Um, and I mean, maybe this is the confidence boost that he needs to, to sail through qualities next time as well. To semis and, and, and further. Um, so yeah, that's my, my big surprise winner. Yeah. This is always such an exciting time after the first World Cup when we have had a couple of these people that 
seem to kind of climb out of their normal ability level, right? We we saw it here with Hannes. We we saw it maybe maybe with Serato, sixteen year old Serato. We've seen it in the past with someone like Oceana McKenzie, for example, a couple years ago. And so it be, and I say it's exciting because it could be a one off thing, and it could just be that Hannes caught lightning in a bottle this one competition and we might never see him in the finals again or on a podium again or it could have been the start of some consistency and some regularity in the finals and i think we can all agree that we've seen it go both ways with competitors in the past and so the fact that we do sit on this sort of 50 50 lottery ticket right now (laughs) with with the with these these several people who were these fresh faces in the finals that's fun. The unknown is is really interesting there heading into the rest of this season. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, what you Oceana there in Myring and was it like 3 years ago or 2 years ago? That's like a perfect yeah. example of the same 19. Okay, even 4 years ago, damn, before a pandemic. So, okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it's when I saw her there, I expected like, wow, this girl would just she's going to, you know, consistently reach if not finals then semis at least, you know. So it, yeah, and then but then on the flip side, you have somebody like maybe a Che Un So in 2019, or maybe a Natalia Grossman in previous seasons, where they have that first, that first uh, finals, you know, great podium performance, and you're thinking, okay, but like, can they can they sustain this? And then they do, and then they do end yeah. up being, uh, you know, several competitions in a row. So yeah, we don't know what. We don't know what Hannes is going to be, which way he's going to go, and that's really fun. Let's let's hope it's a, a more Natalia style debut where it's followed <laughs> up by similar success rather than you know an Oceana or even like an Orienne where it just falls off and gets less and less compelling over the season. But yeah, we'll see what happens. Uh, hmm. Let's talk about big losers then. Um, and uh, I, I I've literally written down a bunch of the Instagram and YouTube comments from this video that the IFSC posted of the dual techs uh, 360 hold, which also happened to have the the black and white smear pattern on it. I'll, I'll put it up on the screen just so people know what I'm talking about. This this particular hold, I think it was men's, what was it, men's two, men's three in finals? Let me, let me find it real quick. Um, but anyway, the IFSC posted this video of Olga Nimitz, one of the root setters, explaining kind of the I guess what they thought was charming about these holds, which is really just that they're regular dual techs slopers, which is not particularly unique, but the fact that they have this visual pattern on them makes it maybe a little bit harder to see where the texture is and where it isn't. Um, And the internet was predictably stupid about it and decided to just start commenting absolute garbage on on this video complaining about it you know i'm i'm not going to start reciting all this stuff because i did literally write down a bunch of comments and usernames and i was going to end this just by <laughs> totally calling people out but that's not what's going to happen um but i kind of just wanted to talk about this topic my loser basically is the spectators which is a terrible way to end a show so <laughs> I'm going to, and I know some of them were, you know, Plastic Weekly Discord people and in the crowd. So I'm really going to try and chill out. But I want to talk about these holds. I don't know if you guys saw that video. I'm not sure if you bothered to read the comments, but it seemed like it was kind of a classic case of, I have things I don't like about competition climbing, and I'm going to use this as just a reason to spout them again. So for instance, where you have people that saw this video, expl- it really, it's just a video explaining what a dual text hold is, right? That's all it is. And you have people complaining about parkour and acrobatics and stuff, which has nothing to do with this hold. That's not, it's not the hold's fault that there are moves that you don't like. But just to run off some of the issues, some people talking about it being harder to see, I think on stream, these were kind of difficult to tell what what had texture and what didn't, which parts of the hold had texture and which didn't, but only from afar. When the camera was up close, it was very easy to see where the texture was. It's the part that's not like gleaming the light back. Like it's a mirror finish dual text hold, right? These are, when you climb on these, it's easy to tell where the texture is. And you should know that if you've been in a climbing gym in the last like 10 years, this is not new technology, right? There are people complaining that people were going to be having like foot slips and stuff. And by the way, foot slips happen on every type of hold, not just dual tech slopers. You can happen when there's plenty of texture. People complaining about, you know, oh, I don't want people doing run and jumps off these boulders. 
They didn't. Root setters aren't idiots. They didn't set this to be like a dynamic climb. This was the slabbest, slowest, most pensive, climbingest, like old school climbing you could get given these holds. There was no dynamic movement on any part of this bowler. It just, this really set me off as to how reactionary and silly uh, the internet happened to be over a hold technology that is decades old. Um, I just, it drove me crazy. I almost regret picking this as my loser because I'm just, I'm seeing the red mist right now and I'm definitely, you know, tilted. But uh, that's that was my loser was how crappy the discussion was about these holds, which are really just dual text holds, which you've seen a million times. But like, uh, I have to ask you, does that, did I misunderstand this? But Because uh, I thought they were actually, you know, textured tape on it. That was the thing, these holds. No, what, do you mean like the black and white part, or what did you think? No, that, no, no, no. The, the actual texture that it was tape that it put on the holes. No, I think it was it was pretty much. Uh, you know how you see the uh, like a cheetah did a lot of it, especially like uh, five years mm. ago and before, where you would have the like in cheetah's case they would have strips of no text, right? So you would have right, these right. kind of like stripes of gloss. This was kind of the opposite of that. So the entire volume was gloss, but then there would be a stripe of texture. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I don't exactly. think it was applied no. by tape. Maybe maybe it was in the production, but it, it looked more like it was just oh. they had they had molded it out, right? Um, so oh, right. It, okay. the the shaping wasn't particularly unique at all. Like if you took away the white and black coloring of it, it would be a very pedestrian dual text volume, like really nothing new. So that is yeah. nothing. Like you said, it's nothing. Right? It's nothing it's at all. Normal it's hole. Not a point of discussion whatsoever. And that just really yeah. broke me that these are the people I'm trying to make videos for, and maybe I need right. to rethink. The life choices but anyway yeah. must have been wishful thinking from me then because this is the thing that i have discussed with with like root setter friends sure uh, well i'm not a root setter but they are right. the friends um that it would be a good idea to actually have strips to put on or mm -hmm. pull off you know right oh it doesn't matter because it wasn't the case in this case though. yeah Man, i've had so right. many bad experiences <laughs> with like taped like grip tape and all that stuff i there is a uh, a local comp around here where they had a, a volume that wasn't quite good enough. So two days before they applied grip tape to the volume to pinch it. Right. And of course, after right. like the first or second climber, the grip tape peels right off in finals. And so now you've got to re-glue the grip tape on because you don't have any comparable hold to replace it with. You have to stop finals for like 50 minutes, hoping that the glue cures. And of course it doesn't, it was just like a complete disaster. Um, so yeah, anyway, I oh, tape, okay. tape scares the crap out of me, man. I, I don't want to deal with that stuff at all, but yeah, anyway. But, uh... I love the passion of those kinds of comments. I want to say that. I That's like the most people... democratic way you can possibly well, put this. But... I love I love your passion. <laughs> here's what I will add, though, or here's what I will say. I find that a lot of times, whenever, in this case, with, with these particular holds, this was the case. We've also seen these kind of comments whenever there's a, a rule change made. Uh, a prominent rule change uh, whenever competitors are told what was it a couple years ago or a year ago there was that controversy with the competitors were told that they couldn't uh, preview the routes or something like that or it was remember that the, oh, we moved to like photos and iso or whatever mm -hmm. last season That's right yeah. yeah and 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 also we've been hearing this forever with as parkour has come into comp climbing more the resonant thing that so many people say is this is not what climbing is and they're so passionate about that. And I always take that as climbing is not something set. It's not something set in stone. So when you're saying this is not what climbing is, well, climbing isn't isn't anything. Climbing is ever evolving. So I, I don't understand when people have this adherence that, that something different or something new is. Uh, it, 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 it's like they're they're comparing it to something that isn't solidified in the first place. So I always kind of take that those comments about this is not what climbing is. That always perplexes me because we have something here climbing that can't be. It doesn't have linear definitions. It it doesn't have uh, harsh borders. It's it's a very fluid thing. And climbing is whatever people make it with these new additions and these new endeavors and these new holds and these new rules and all of that that's still climbing because climbing continually changes and it's never going to be one set thing 
I think I think yeah. you're right. And unless you, know, you ask the Amish people, I guess, like you know, <laughs> is there is there is there a a Pennsylvania Dutch sect of com, like competitive <laughs> climbing, and it's all everything's still <laughs> polyester? <laughs> <laughs> that's something we gotta okay that's an idea now that's that would be a fun competition in a barn of course if somebody's just got to find a barn uh, on the outskirts of pittsburgh and we can do a fun midwest comp john <laughs> that's that's a project for the for the winter um no i wanted to say like i mean it is a tradition in climbing to just complain about whatever the new kids are doing and i hate that i'm being baited into this discussion that's been happening for decades right like the i can't remember I, the letter the letter of 12 climbers or whatever it was basically bardonecchia that first competition in 86 a bunch of the pro climbers wrote this screed saying the competition is not you know is not climbing and is not in the spirit of climbing and it's that that has continued whatever that issue happens to be there's always people complaining about it so you're entirely right but there are there are two there are two comments i want to complain about and the first one is people there was one guy that said i don't want climbing to be climbers feeling around for friction and that made me so mad because i hate outdoor climbing i'm not interested in climbing outdoors at all i'm a complete gym rat but the entire experience of climbing climbing outdoors is blindly sticking your hands into holes, just looking for whatever <laughs> friction you can find. So this couldn't be more real rock climbing than this. And the last one I want to point out, just because they're a pro and you were asking for it, is Yannick Flohey gives a snarky little one word reply to this video. He just asks, why? That's all. Just ask, just wondering, like, why are we doing this? Like, Yannick, you, you were born into modern bouldering where it's always pushing limits. Like, what about this hold confuses you, man? Your recent posts on your Instagram, are you holding a drill? Like you've been root setting. What's, what is the question, Yannick? I don't know. Elaborate. Give us a, give us a reason why you had a salient thought in that moment that this hold is somehow bad. Like, I don't, I don't know what it is he's thinking, but that was a, a pointless question from somebody that should honestly understand the ecosystem that he's participating in. And, and yeah, I, that just baffled me why you would bother to leave such a, a dense and, and vague comment like that on a video. But anyway, that let's move on. That was my loser. Somebody else go Bjorn. What, what was your loser from this event? Oh, Japan all stars. Uh, I mean, we're in yeah. Japan. Uh, I mean, Japan traditionally, they don't do well at home, but I mean, we have all these big stars, Tomoa, Yoshi, Miho, you know, and they frankly didn't perform. No. And I'm surprised somewhat, but also disappointed. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. Plus that. I mean, sure, there were um, also um, Japanese surprises to some, I guess. Um, Surata, Surato, Surata, Surato, young guy. Yeah. Sorato, yeah, he's, um, I mean, he did, I have to say, I actually nailed the, the, um, the women's podium. <laughs> did time. you really? And I did. <laughs> Not many people would have got that one. <laughs> oh, and also I had uh, Sorata in, in the final. But anyway, I wasn't surprised uh, considering what he's done in the Japan Cup. So um, they have lots of young climbers coming, but I'm disappointed in the old guard. John, what do you think? It kind of feels a little bit like deja vu maybe to last season, especially in regards to Miho. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I feel like I remember Miho having a slow start to last season as well. Uh, uh, I'd have to look it up. I didn't I didn't look it up prior to this, but I kind of remember us discussing like what's up with Miho? She's had a bunch of injuries. Is this the sign that maybe her career, her comp career is is on the uh, uh, sort of the permanent downswing and that turned out not to be the case she rallied in the latter half of last season but i do think here we are again kind of wondering what's this season going to hold with miho right she's had those injuries she's getting a little older uh, she has probably more fame than most competitors on the circuit in part because the olympics and in part just because she's a charismatic personality. Whether or not that plays into any of this, I don't know. That's up for people to kind of speculate about. But but of all those stars that you are talking about, Bjorn, I think Tomoa and Miho are the ones that I kind of have the biggest question marks about at this point, just because they've been on the circuit for so long. They've been at a high level for so long. And at some point, they won't be able to, to stay at that level. That's just the sad inevitability of athletics 
are we there yet? I I don't know. But I do feel like we had this conversation at the beginning of last season, too. Yeah, and I gotta say that, like, like I said before, it's it's still only one comp, though. And, and uh, mm-hmm. like, Miho, she was really close. I mean, had she done the last problem in the semis, she would have been in the final, right? And same thing with uh, Tomoa. He was so close to doing that slap that Hannes did. Had he done it, he would have been in the final, right? I think so, anyway. <laughs> uh, so it would have been a completely different story. But the way it played out, disappointing. This is a very disappointing narrative, given where it was mm. and, and starting an Olympic qualification season. I completely agree. Yeah, Miho, like, me, last time Miho got a gold was five years ago, right? It was the season opener in 2018. And since then, through the injuries and through the odd Olympic cycle and, and COVID and all that stuff, uh, there's all these different reasons to say, oh, she can come back, right? There's plenty of reasons to say that there were complicating factors making it harder for her to to end up, you know, on a podium or get a gold medal. But at this point, I don't really think of her as, as you know, even guaranteed for a final anymore. At most, I kind of, I do expect her to still make most finals. I think that's a reasonable expectation, but I don't really consider her a favorite anymore, right? Like, Yanya is still my my top tier favorite if she's at a comp natalia is the clear second and then brooke hannah they can fight out for the rest but miho's below them at this point it's just been too long really um and and so it's uh it's it's uh, for for her specifically because i think it's easier to to think of her by herself now that akio has gone and futaba and, and the other female climbers haven't come up to to make kind of a consistent team for the men's side though i kind of realize my thoughts are a little bit blurry because i i don't think about tomoa or yoshiyuki or kokoro as individual climbers so much anymore i realize i can just make these vague points about though the japanese men's team there's always one of them but it's you know it's a different guy more more recently yoshiyuki's the consistent guy um but yeah like i mean kokoro is past 30 at this point and and i i try not to use age as a reason for people to fall off anymore but as more of those guys become dads and as more olympic cycles pass i you know I, I don't want to use this comp and I and I haven't used this to affect my priors. Everything was very close, right? Like it was a two boulder semifinal. I, I don't really care how the results played out. But if there's many more results like this, then that it's gonna change really quick from them being favorites. It would like it was really just jarring to not see any Japanese men on a podium. That was really mm. crazy. I think the last time that happened, it was because the Japanese team wasn't there, if I remember right. Like there was a Salt Lake comp possibly where the Japanese team just didn't come for one of the rounds. And so we had a, a European podium because of that. But that's a really weird thing to see. It's it's weird to see two French climbers and a Belgian climber on a podium when you had, what, 12 Japanese men competed at this competition. That's pretty nuts. So it's, uh, yeah, certainly a disappointment. When was the last time that happened to French and a Belgian on a podium? I don't, first I don't think two, two French and a Belgian ever. The last time there was two French oh. was 20, I think it was Laval 2014, when I think it was Jeremy Bonder and like Guillaume Clarence Monde mm. at that World Cup. Um, yeah, it's, it's been a while. Like the last time it was two French climbers on a podium was like 10 years ago. Um, it's, you know, France, France ain't what it used to be when it, when it comes to, you know, the, the story days of the late, uh, the late nineties and the early two thousand yeah. and stuff. Right. But care, care, careful now, like they have a strong team now. <laughs> they, well, they've, they've almost always had like strong climbers, but you know, for whatever reason, it, it doesn't always mm-hmm. add up as having many of them, but it would be, again, it'd be great to see. I love the idea that this historical arc comes back. Right. And suddenly France is, is not just like, Hey, we have a lot of athletes in the semis and finals, but actually get some medals more frequently i think Mm. that would be a lot of fun france and japan the two like historical bouldering powerhouses that'd be amazing that'd be great so yeah Yeah. john who's your loser well it's good that we're kind of diving into some historical statistics here because my loser would be the u.s men the u.s men's squad uh i'll just did they even compete this weekend (laughs) <laughs> like well, that's, that's... I, I'm saying that almost like I don't actually know. Did they were any of them in semifinals? The, no, they were okay, not. In so I wasn't just being forgetful. There was not a single American man in semifinals. Right. Let Crazy. me let me riff through this year's results. So uh, at this Hachioji event, 
Colin Duffy was the highest placing American man. He was in 27th. So that like that's not even on the bubble of semis, right? I mean, kind what of. What was it? But... 90, 90 men? Like, obviously, that's way too low for Colin Duffy if that becomes a regular result. But yeah, like, I know what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. And, and to be clear, I'm not saying I don't expect this to be a regular result. This is just isolated to Hachioji. But Colin Duffy, 27th. Hugo Hoyer, 31st. Sean Bailey, 39th. Dylan Countryman, 47th. Zach Gala, 56th. And Jesse Gruper at 61st. So as we said, no American men, obviously in the finals, but no American men even in the semifinals. Uh, nobody even arguably on the bubble for semifinals. And so I thought I, I, I'd look into the history a little bit. And so let me look, I jotted down on the, on the post-it notes here. So looking at last year, 2022, the season opener, which was in Mayringen, the American men placed as such, Colin Duffy was fifth place. So he was a fine. So there was a finalist. Ben Hanna was 15th. So there was a semifinalist and Ross Falkerson was 27th so their their third place man last season 27th ross fulkerson was the same as this year's highest placing man in colin duffy 2027th at hachioji uh and then there were you know last year sean bailey was 47th jesse grouper was down farther down Uh, now let's go back even farther 2021 season opener also in mayringen Nathaniel Coleman, the uh, American men, Nathaniel Coleman, fifth place, so a finalist. Sean Bailey, 13th place, semifinalist. Ross Fulkerson, 16th place, semifinalist. Then there were a couple guys below that. 2020 pandemic season, obviously that was a wash. 2019 in Mayringen, they didn't have quite the depth, but they did have 17th place Nathaniel Coleman, so they had a semifinalist in 2019. And 2018, also in Mayringen, season opener, Nathaniel Coleman was 17th, semifinalist. So you have to go all the way back to 2017 to find a season opener where the American men did worse. For what it's worth, 2017, the Austin Guyman was 35th. He was the highest placing American man. Sean Rabatou was 43rd. Daniel Woods was 45th. So it's a completely different That's like generation. an entirely different reality. The fact that Sean, A, Sean Rabatou is competing, which is wild. But secondly, Austin Guyman, who I think just had like the year of his life at the Nationals that year. But let, like, I want to talk about the specifics of it because these particular men are really relying on, on basically three people. And there's only really three that are notable. It's Colin Duffy, Nathaniel Coleman, and Sean Bailey. Sean Bailey's always been crazy up and down. I never know quite where his head's at or what he's focusing on i i honestly don't know where he's at nathaniel coleman he's done right like is this guy an olympic hopeful like is he going for the olympics is he around because he seems to be getting on the kilter board a lot i don't know what his what his vibe is but i don't feel like like i feel like once the olympics was over in tokyo he took some time off and i honestly don't know if he's coming back um so now the only person I really rely on is Colin Duffy. He's the one guy that I feel like, yeah, that's somebody that I would say like, you know, three out of four times, I expect him to be in finals and, and he's a medal contender when he is. But like a Sean Bailey, it's just a complete crapshoot. Like it could be a gold medal. It could be like a do not start, honestly. Like I have, I have no idea what that guy. Yeah, we, I, we talked about this last year, how as an American fan or even anybody following the American scene, you want to be a little cautious saying that they have such such depth because the reality is the american men at least in previous seasons were anchored by Colin Duffy okay he's the, he's still young uh, Nathaniel Coleman Sean Bailey a little bit older in their comp careers certainly mm-hmm. Jesse Grouper he's kind of a late bloomer in his comp performance Jesse's he's, also he's not, not a boulderer like i don't expect to see true. him anywhere on a boulder yeah, but then and and then on the American women's side, you have Natalia and Brooke, but then I I'm still kind of wanting to see some of the other American women start rising up the ranks a bit, which we haven't really seen yet. Well, they, and I know Chloe this year was quite good last year, wasn't she? Chloe has had some bright spots yeah. for sure, and yeah. and I think uh, and Ross Fulkerson, for what it's worth, had a mm. uh, great performance last season. And I know this year there's this 
hope any any Sanders, this youngster that's on the circuit, uh, no, you know, who knows what will how happen. How that but- hype work out this weekend, folks? How, how where's where's the Andy Sanders hype train now? I I was actually Dead pretty satisfied with where she is. Where it's at? I, but yeah, I think sure. I think there's no reason for Americans fans to think otherwise of Annie Sanders. I think it was great. Her first adult World Cup. It was fine. Uh, but anyway, my point is, I I agree with you, Tyler. There's there. It's like there, there's a couple of Americans, a few Americans that are at the top, and then there's pretty vacant middle, and then there's a a lot in the lower quadrants. So. Uh, I don't know. I'd like to see some of those middle quadrant people start working up into the higher section. Maybe, maybe this will be Chloe's year. We'll see. But uh, for this one, yeah, yeah the American I, men yeah. disappointing. I thought both uh, Chloe and, and Kylie would do better this time than they did, obviously. But I mean, could be any number of reasons. Yeah, I think that that's in line with what a lot of American viewers, American fans have thought. They're kind of they're, they're kind of thinking that at some point Chloe and Kylie will maybe get into that upper echelon, start pushing the semis, maybe get into the bubble of finals and stuff. Hasn't happened yet, but it's early in the mm-hmm. season. I was just trying to see what group the Americans were in and I'm see, I'm seeing does it look like Colin and yeah, Colin and Sean were both in the group where like the the number of tops they were getting fell off very fast. Um, like Hugo, Hugo Hoyer, you mentioned he got three tops. He finished lower than those guys. Right. Or was he above them? Like, anyway, he got three tops. Whereas like Sean and Colin only got one in a round. That was kind of like the tops that were toppable were mostly flashes. And then stuff got really hard, really fast. Um, yeah. Yeah. Unusual groups this time around. But I, I think all I would say, John, just to remind you, be, be grateful for what you have because the Canadian team isn't even at a level enough for them to be my loser. So you know, well, and it's be, like be I grateful said, that you've got some you got some metal contenders. Absolutely, and I don't want to isolate. I don't want to draw this out into anything other than this isolated event because last season we st- we saw that the American men, as I read the results, there they started really strong, but then in the next World Cup last season they they dipped. They did not have a good performance. So. Maybe this will be the opposite of kind of a slow start, and then maybe at the next comp, the next World Cup, they will they will rise. I'm not going to draw any conclusions beyond this one event. And mm. to your point, as far as I know, Tyler, yes, Nathaniel is still eyeing the Paris 2024 Olympics uh, because he was at national team trials and whatnot. Uh, time will tell, but um, we'll see what happens next weekend for the American men. I expect them to do better than this. I, I think... We have no reason to believe this wasn't somewhat of a, a just an unfortunate anomaly for the whole men's squad. Mm-hmm. I also think that a lot of climbers this year actually have their eyes on, on the world championships and qualification for Olympics rather than the World Cup. And that could play into this, like when you want to be on forum and, and, uh, and not to. I think that's a good point, Bjorn, because we also have heard some of the competitors say they were focusing on lead in the lead up to this competition. And I thought that that was a little strange because I'm thinking, well, you're focusing on lead, but once the bouldering season starts, you're going to get in bouldering shape anyway. So like, aren't you going to lose some of those gains that for lead that you had leading up to the, but I'm not a coach, I'm not a trainer. So I'm sure that there's logic that we're not privy to there, but uh, I do agree that the world championships and by extension, the Olympics are probably a bigger focus for some of these competitors than World Cups. Yeah. Um, Seoul is only a few days away. I'm curious if you guys have anything in particular you're looking forward to, maybe a boulder, maybe just the start of the uh, of the speed season. What uh, What are you guys excited about for the comp that starts in just a few days? Speed season. Yeah. I mean, we have seen some extremely quick times i mean even though that's on practice or in yeah. smaller comps it's it's um quite impressive what's gonna i mean what we've seen already i would i would be surprised if we don't see a world record set in the men's division considering that we we know for a fact several of them can go sub five we just saw what a day or two ago, Sam Watson posted on Instagram that he had a run that he went sub five. So 
I'm definitely looking forward to the speed, the start of the speed season. For me, a, a big question, and I know our friend Josh on speedclimbing.com has posed this as well. A big intriguing point is the women's division, because while there are a number of men that seem hovering around the sub five mark, that world record mark, we have not seen that many women that are hovering around um, Miroslav's world record. Now, that doesn't mean they don't exist, right? They might be, but we have not seen that kind of chatter. We don't really know what the Indonesian women are are doing in terms of their top times. We don't necessarily know what the China Team China women are doing in their top times, but it doesn't seem, by all indications, like there is that traffic jam at the top uh, close to that world record in the women's division like there is in the men's division. So that question mark is intriguing to me. True. I mean, we had this, uh, I don't remember her name, obviously, a uh, Chinese girl that was within like two 100s, I think, of a second, like 655 or something in Chamonix, I think it was. But then again, do any of you know why why uh, Ola Miroslav's 640 wasn't official? The one from... At the Nationals? That, was that no, Nationals it Nationals or the like Continental Europe, Cup? European Cup, and I think tar- I don't know how to pronounce Polish words, Tarnov, but Tarnov? I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, my, my understanding was it wasn't a it wasn't a tested wall. Like it's not a it wasn't a world record. Um, so they didn't bring the ruler. The guy with the ruler didn't no. come out to check. So you know, that's how that goes in this sport. Apparently, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's uh, so strange. Yeah, but I was I was gonna say it's like it's honestly I'm okay with having having the men's being this cat fight for the record, and then having the women's be the opposite because we kind of saw it this is kind of reverse of what we've seen for the last couple years where the women's record was quite achievable for for a while for you know from from 2017 through we saw a regular chipping away at it um 2019 was the big year where we saw uh eri susanti raheu and and yiling song and and a lot of people tearing away and getting very close whereas the men's was so stagnant for so long um Mm. i i'm you know give give this a season and maybe maybe the record will settle. I think that's what I'm most interested in to see if we're just going through this unique period in time where because of this new Olympic focus on speed, maybe we're seeing this burst that we'll never see again. Or maybe this is kind of like the what we should expect to see from speed climbing until the returns diminish so far that it's just, you know, rare again. Because I'm honest, like we talked about it in our award show, it's baffling to me that a single athlete was able to chip off his own time so consistently. And the fact that there's other climbers that could do the same is wild. Like that's not, that is not how speed climbing has historically worked. So I'm curious to see if this is an anomaly that we get to enjoy while, while it happens, or if this is a new reality, because that's, that would be something very, it would be a, a unique a unique situation for speed climbing, for sure. Um, yeah. I'm, aside from speed climbing, I'll say, correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't Seoul last year marred by terrible weather? There was just rain uh, at the at the comp all the time. I, th- I seem to remember the, the venue was really... The venue neat. was, was kind like of beside a waterfall. waterfall. So I'm curious yes. if you're just like mm-hmm. confusing the waterfall with rain, but it could have been <laughs> raining. I don't I don't quite remember, honestly. Me it neither. Actually. Been, I, um, well, regardless, whether it was bad weather last year or not, I'm hoping since it is an outdoor venue and I, having lived in South Korea, I know that the weather can be pretty uh, unpredictable in April and May uh, with rain and stuff. I'm hoping we have some nice weather and uh, uh, yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. I'm just excited for another comp. Hopefully we get some results in bouldering that are a little bit easier to understand. Hopefully we get some more tops and, and try and get back to kind of a, uh, a more predictable level. And if there are outstanding athletes, hopefully they got to earn it by earning, you know, more than two tops to, uh, to get a silver medal, but we'll see. Granted. Okay. Sure. A few more tops, but I just hope we don't get a flash comp just because this I is... completely agree. And I like not to, not to start a whole new topic, but I love tops flashes are too far give me i'll take 24 tops and finals just make them work for it like that's that's kind of my (laughs) my vibe is lots of tops no flashes um let's wrap it there so we can all move on with our day um john as always thank you for joining us bjorn pole first time first time here on the podcast of course make sure you go check out the interviews that he's done with the likes of meshji shalk very recently adam andra and a very interesting one if you're if you watch a podcast like this you would probably be interested in listening to marco scaleris talk about 
about his history in the sport, which was actually pretty fascinating. It was nice to hear him talk mm -hmm. about the history because every time I talked to him, he's like, I don't want to talk about the past. I want to talk about the future. So it was nice that you managed to get some some history out of him. I really loved that uh, <laughs> that episode. That was great. So check that out. Link is in the description below. Make sure you subscribe. Um, to you guys watching, of course, thanks for making it this far. You should subscribe, leave a like, leave a comment on anything we talked about. Uh, and again, if you make it to the end of the video, you've got to join the Plastic Weekly Discord. It's full of other diehards who love talking about competition climbing and watching the comps yeah. together. So hop in there as well. Otherwise, on behalf of Bjorn and John, thanks so much for watching and we'll see you guys in the next one.